yes. It's the Hardcore Marketing Show. Yes. My name is Casey Cheshire. I am your host for this epic journey. And today, today's show sponsored by Cheshire Impact. Who are these guys? On a mission to help you maximize your use of Pardot and Salesforce. CheshireImpact.com. Bam. Now, my guest today is awesome. And we're, we're, we're talking across the oceans, thousands of miles away um, in Israel. He is a strategist. Uh, international business development is one of his specialties, sales. Uh, he's write, writing books on this, uh, cross-cultural social marketing and sales, how they can all align, which is perfect because that's the theme today. He speaks multiple languages. He's the VP of BizDev at KSW Solutions, former crew chief, Israeli Air Force. We're going to get to that hardcore and then also the author of a great book there's all these books out there in sales all these highfalutin things with crazy metaphors his book is an introduction to sales in the 21st century those basics that especially marketers need to know about my guest tal paperin how are you sir i'm doing super thank you for asking <laughs> well, uh, what welcome. a fantastic day yeah now, well, now how far, having me. what time like how far away is the time where you're at right now uh, we're GMT plus three. It's five o'clock in the afternoon here. Oh, okay. I was good. I was hoping it wasn't going to be like four or 5 a.m. for you. <laughs> yes. You need a couple more Ab coffees. Absolutely. Gotta love the coffee. Absolutely, man. Cheers to that. I got mine right here. So um, the theme we were talking about earlier, the theme, you know, mm -hmm. each month has been a different theme on this roadmap because a lot of marketers were out there buying Pardot, buying Salesforce or other tools. Marketo, HubSpot, and they're out there and they're not using them fully. They're just using them like MailChimp. They're just blasting people. They're not, they're just, just doing tactics. They're not doing strategy, which I know we want to smash too. And so they're out there just doing this stuff. So we built a roadmap. Now, each month has been a different theme. And this theme right now is all about aligning sales and marketing. Marketers need to know more about sales so they can better supply good leads, so they can better support the sales teams. Sales teams, need to know more about sales, but from the basics, because sometimes we get ahead of ourselves. So, you know, I just want to pass you Thor's hammer and see if there's anything you want to smash right up front. You know, any myth that you're hearing out there, that you just like, it drives you crazy and you just need to like write the record straight. All right. So I'll start from, from basics and I'll start, I'll do a quick introduction. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I read this magnificent survey from 2014 saying that nine out of 10 companies will eventually end up bankrupt. Nine out of 10. And the main reason for those companies going bankrupt is lack of sales. That's the main reason. Right. Meaning so many companies, so many good people out there, they come up with a product or a service, they develop it, they manufacture it, and then they're stuck. They don't know how to sell it, where to sell it, and what should they be doing with their product. Right. And, and that is like a, a general outlook on the thing. But if you zoom in, you see that there's many myths that preventing salespeople from performing, a company from performing. You said, here's Thor's Hammer, so I'll start with the yeah. main one. Yeah, smash the, the, away. The, the, the main one that I hate. There's a lot of CEOs or VP of sales that just jump in on their staff and they say, listen, I don't care what it is that you do, just bring me money. I want to see mm -hmm. results. I want to see money. All I care about is the bottom line. Right. And they throw the person into the water or they hire uh, an external company to do their either lead gen or their marketing or whatever. And they say, do whatever it is you want. I don't care. Just get me money. Mm. Six months later into the project, you look and you say, oh my God, I burned through so much cash. I burned through so much uh, time and have zero results. I wonder why. Right. The main reason for that is lack of plan, lack of strategic planning. Mm. From day one, you need to have a detailed plan. Yeah? You need to have a very, very detailed plan saying, where are you going? How are you going to go there? And why? Right. The why is very important. And the why is maybe reason number one. Because if, for example, your plan is to sell your product in China, and that's because you heard that's a huge market, but then you drill down and you see that your product is not suitable for China and you need to take it to Germany. That should be your plan of action. Right. But so many people just, they, what, they go right to the tactics, right? They're skipping strategy, busy skipping work. Completely. It's like activity busy. alone will do it, right? If I just hustle enough in, in a bad way, it'll somehow right the wrongs. Oh, yeah. 
you know, hustling like it's uh, like you're back in the 70s or back in the 80s doesn't work in the 21st century. Mm. That will be myth number two. <laughs> myth number Smash. two. Smash. Smash. The sales <laughs> world has changed. Salespeople no longer sell snow to Eskimos because the Eskimo has YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, WeChat, and several <laughs> others. Right. The Eskimo knows exactly what's the value of the snow he has. So if you as a salesperson going to show up there and try to hustle him and try to offer him snow, he knows better than you what's the value of that. Right. But then if you'll piss him off, he's going to make a viral YouTube video about you and your company trying to sell him snow and you will no longer be able to sell anything ever again. It's anyone. <laughs> I, I personally participated. I went to Germany uh, two years ago now to a big expo in Cologne, a huh. city in Germany. And me and the CEO of the company were walking through companies and each company that he approaches and he says, hi, my name is, I'm from those other guys. They look and say, oh, we heard about you. We will never be doing business with you. Every single one. He walked by probably 30 companies from 30 different countries. And wow. every single one said, I know you. I heard about you. I'm not interested in doing business with you. Wait, wait. So this and is then, someone you were walking with at the show? Absolutely, yeah. I was hired to yeah. try and fix this problem. Oh, dang. Uh, and I said, I want to see what the problem is. So the CEO <laughs> said, listen, we did some mistakes. Uh, we tried to sell aggressively and the product wasn't very good uh, or very market ready. Right. We tried anyway. And now nobody wants to deal with us. Jeez. I'm like, I'm like I want to see this happening. So we flew to the industry's main expo. Yeah. And in the expo, you have uh, several hundred companies from sure. across the globe. But every single person that we approached already heard about this company. Wow, that, that's, a, that's a rough challenge, man. Uh, are you going to fix that? That was, that was insane. That, that happened two years ago. Oh, two years ago. Uh, yeah. And ever since, uh, some very painful decisions had to be made. The entire management of the company had to go. Yeah. Um, and an official letter was made saying that the CEO... All the VPs, VP of R&D, VP of sales, uh, senior VP, and then the, all the team leaders are pretty much three layers down. From the top three layers down, all of them had to go. The product was redone. Two factories were changed uh, for parts. So the entire company was restructured, rebranding. I'm talking about the new logo, a yeah. new website. Yeah, new brand, new everything. You got to. Yeah. But, but, and here's the, here's the cool part. This was caused by salespeople. All of this was salespersons. Really? Thing. You have those big shots that show up back to the office and they say, listen, I just closed a massive deal. Right. I pushed some goods onto somebody who maybe doesn't really need it. <laughs> but I closed the deal. Ah, I brought the company some, I know, a million bucks. Right. And if you're smart and you know how the world works, you're going to grab your head and you're like, yeah. oh my God. That million dollars is going to cost me a hundred million dollars yeah. down the line. And that down the line is going to happen very quickly. And to your earlier point, if the CEOs are out there saying, I don't care how it happens, just do it. And, the, and if the salesperson does this, they didn't even know. They probably didn't even realize. They probably like, good job, man. Go, go find some more suckers out there. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe. And then they absolutely. just, and they just spiles it. Cause, cause you know what? That's actually kind of impressive. If everyone at the trade shows heard of you, that's some pretty good marketing. Unfortunately, it's all negative. <laughs> um, the way it goes, I'll give you just, a, just an example. Imagine yeah. you work for Home Depot, okay? Sure. And your job is to purchase um, uh, greenhouses for Home Depot, okay? Tomorrow, you're going to go and you're going to leave Home Depot, but that's your job. You're a purchase agent of uh, greenhouses. So you're going to go to the next one. Uh, you'll go to Walmart, for example. Sure. What's, what's going to happen is you're going to bring your knowledge and your expertise. You're also on the professional forums of buyers of greenhouses. Right. So if you have, a, let's say, a Vietnamese manufacturer of really crappy greenhouse, you're going to post that on that forum. Guys, never buy that greenhouse. Yeah. So all the buyers of greenhouses in the industry will hear about that manufacturer. <laughs> oh, man.
Absolutely. What you, you want know, is the, the opposite, person. right? You want you want to wow people so well, be so over overvalued and underpriced that people are like, "This is a steal, man!" You got to go get you know, like sometimes at our Home Depot, we'll have mulch on sale for you know four bags for ten dollars. Like the word spreads, hey, the mulch, yeah, it's on sale. Hey, go go get it, go get it. You know, you want that other kind of, you want that positive vibe spreading around the community. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, depends if you're selling on a B2B or B2C. For sure. But, uh, but, the, but the bottom line is, uh, and here's the, the difference between sales and marketing. Yeah. Uh, in, in our age, there, there isn't much. There isn't much. Sure, maybe traditionally, the marketing people will be the guys that's going to draw you a nice logo. Maybe. Right. Uh, but at the end of the day, sales are using marketing heavily. Right. Like that promotion. That promotion that you're talking about, the four bags for a hundred, uh, that's marketing, but that promotion was started by sales. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it's so it's so yeah. intertwined these days. They're so and I, that was kind of more of a retail, but to your point, yeah, especially when it gets into the B2B realm, it's so blended. You know, maybe that collateral was created by marketing, but sales is the one presenting it and talking through it. And yeah, you know, I actually was gonna say I thought sales dressed better than marketing. But um, maybe that's just me. <laughs> Absolutely, that's that's also a great way to to uh, to tell who's the sales guy is right. at the big expo, at the big convention. Yeah, is by the suit. <laughs> yeah, is by the suit. That's why if you want to get attention and you want people like come over and like treat you like a VIP, come to a very important event in shorts and a tank top, like a white <laughs> wife beater with stain. Yeah, maybe a can of beer. <laughs> Show up like that. I had the, I had this like I learned this on my on my Did own. Did you try that? Uh, Did you try that once? It it went the opposite. I showed up to a, to a big event and I was wearing a tuxedo, uh, wow. like everybody else were. And there were yeah. two guys in shorts and flip flops and tank tops. So I'm like, who the hell led those two bozos through the yeah, door, right? right? And I come over to talk to them and I'm like, so what do you guys do? Like, are you in the kitchen or what? what are you janitors? What are you doing? And they're like, well, we have a world's largest re online retailing website. I'm like, what? What's your turnover? They're like, it's something like 80 million uh, euros. I'm like, <laughs> 80 million euros a year. They're like, yep. I'm like, that's, that's, that's bullshit. It's like, where's my phone? I Googled them. Yep. Those are the guys. World's like largest in the field. And they come into an expo in shorts because they don't care. Wow. It, did a lot of people want to talk to them to find out what's going on? Or was that apparently apparently I, I fell asleep and I missed this entire trend. But the yeah. trend is like uh so there's a few uh personas that I like, a lot of like authors. Yeah. I really yeah. like I really like James Keenan. Okay. So he made this video that was fantastic and he said that by the time you actually meet someone it doesn't matter what you're wearing because your first actual face-to-face -face meeting isn't your actual meeting because that person, by that point that you meet him, should have heard about you, right. seen your videos, seen your content online, seen your posts, seen your marketing material. So he knows all about you. So pretty much it's irrelevant what is it that you're wearing. The guy knows who you are. Um, I used to put many like videos on on different platforms in a yeah. suit and a tie now i'm just talking to him in a t-shirt yeah um because i got old and tired probably <laughs> too many too much ironing <laughs> too much ironing now <laughs> too much work no you know, it, it's it i love that you know the first face to face isn't isn't that first time you meet them in person they've heard about Absolutely you not. they've seen your videos they've seen your posts it's so true it's so true. That's, that's what helps me out, you know. Um, yeah, I show up and they're like, who's this guy? Oh, it's Casey. He's the man. No, I'm just – but, like, you know, like they, they maybe read that thing or they heard about Cheshire Impact. Or they heard about, you know, hey, you're that company. Great. And then you're right. It doesn't matter as much. I, maybe there's like, a, a, like a, a check or a check minus depending on how you fit. But at, at the same time, the bigger part happens before you even meet. Yeah, that, that's a good Absolutely. One. You know, it's like um... – the United States is a huge place. Israel is much smaller, 
and the business community here is very segregated. Interesting. So I went, I went to um, a startup accelerator uh, where I live. Uh, but do you know what it is? Uh, startup accelerator? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I show up to one of those, and I was just a guest. I wasn't even a speaker, and I'm sitting in the crowd. Yeah. And at the end of the speech, there's a, there's a mingling kind of an event. Uh, and I go outside, and I had four people coming over to me to shake my hand. They're like, oh, my God, there's this guy from LinkedIn. We watch every single video of yours. Really? I'm like, I'm like I don't even know who you are. I have right. no idea. Uh, that was very embarrassing. Some of those people I actually knew. Um, Isn't that hard I, when you're not sure if you should know them or not? And you're, hey, great to see you. Great to meet you. <laughs> another very important thing that I figured yeah. out, that there's a very uh, fine line between politeness and honesty. Yeah. So for example, yeah. so for example, if I'd be like, like, oh my God, it is so nice to see you. The guy in theory could be like, is it so nice to see me? Do you even know who I am or what right. my company name is? That's a good point. And then you lose face. Yep. So instead, I'm saying, it is nice to see you. Yep. It is a pleasure. Thank you for watching my videos. I'm sorry, but I, I don't know who you are. Yeah. Where are you from? What do you do? What's your business? What's your company? Yeah. How can we make money together? How can I help you uh, move forward with your business? I agree. Uh, at most honesty at all times or else meaning once yeah. you burn yourself like you know it's one thing if you have a crappy product uh, you can apologize you can recall the product you can issue refunds but once you lose the reputation of a company of a business or um, of a person you're done man. you're done yeah yeah it's that trust factor right Pete you know trust is hard to earn but once you have it it's easy to lose um, and it's not, yeah, that's almost like that, the theme we were just talking about the, through the, the whole first part here was just the idea of, you know, the misusing that trust. And then, you know, that company you're working with, you know, many, many years ago, they lost the trust of people and then they're trying to regain it back. And, and the amount of your point, the amount of work you had to guide them through to get back some to some level of trust, it'll never be as much, but to get back to that was so much more work than just being honest or maybe not hitting so much work so yeah. much money so much uh, like time yeah yeah Jeez. well hey you know, there's another thing we were chatting about maybe you could touch on this and smash this too uh the idea about you know do you need to know much about your customer and it, and it kind of ties into the, even the honesty factor you know we're saying like oh i don't know you but i love to know how we can make money together um you know, are we doing that too much in marketing and sales? Does it matter? What's your take on that? So uh, uh, this is like, this is a, a hilarious question. It is so <laughs> funny to me. Yeah. yeah it's so funny. Um, I was born in the USSR. Oh, wow. And my wife, yeah. And my wife was born in New York. She's an American and I'm Russian. So she is a true American. She always smiles, you know, like Americans, they always smile. Totally. Most it's, of us. In Russia. In Muslim. Russia, there's a saying, when you're in the Soviet bloc, the saying goes, if you smile, that is a sign of a mental problem. <laughs> so if you show up to a business meeting, and the first thing that you do would be to smile, like you're in the States, <laughs> people will treat you like you have a, a severe mental problem. Oh, but no. if you continue being an American and you'll continue smiling through the meeting, People think that you're a clown that could, <laughs> oh, no. that could and should be used and you will be used. Jeez. Now, if you're not aware of that and you don't know that, your first instinct would be, you know, to be yourself, to be an easygoing guy, to shake everybody's hands, to smile, to laugh. That's going to burn you. That will really? make you the clown at the meeting. Wow. Now, that, that's just a personal meeting. But imagine you're doing that as a B2C campaign. Right. Okay. Right. Um, so that's, that's one example. Or another example, I know many companies uh, in the States or in Asia that are trying to penetrate the Eastern markets, the Eastern European, like Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. Um, the significant markets and those companies are trying to get in there. So, you know, like for example, me and you, we met on LinkedIn. Right. And we use Facebook. Yep. So those companies, they're going to hire a company that specializes in Facebook ads and they're going to start a Facebook campaign with the yeah. ad. 
targeting Russian audience. That would be a very dumb mistake because in Russia, they don't use Facebook. They use uh -huh. a local version of Facebook called VK, two letters V and the letter K. And it's the largest social network uh, in the Eastern Bloc. If you haven't bothered looking into that and you go to Facebook, what's even worse, by the way, I'm sorry, that, that's, this is much worse. I've met people that are trying to launch Facebook campaigns targeting China. And Facebook uh, is blocked in China. It's blocked, yeah. I, I've met companies that are doing that. I've met people that are doing like uh, YouTube videos in Chinese, trying to, to gain customers from China. You know? Uh, such a, and China, such a yeah, The Chinese in virtual world is like based around WeChat, for example. Uh, there's many other. Yeah. Uh, or, or Google isn't the search engine. They have a different search engine called Baidu is the main one. Right. Same as in Russia, you have Yandex, for example. Um, so all of those nuances are bringing us back to the point you need to have a plan. You need to have a plan. And in that plan, it needs to say, I am going to target China. And the way I'm going to target China mm -hmm. is by doing this and that. And at least, at least, the, 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 you, what you can do is to read about the culture, to read about the company and the people. And what's best is to actually hire an expert, um, pay him for like, I don't know, two hours, five hours, 10 hours of work, bring yeah. him over to a company and give a presentation. Um, I'm a big believer into outsourcing things. Yeah. Uh, for example, I can build a website. But if I want a professional website, I'm going to outsource that to somebody else. Uh, I'm assuming I can make myself a logo, but I'm going to pay somebody to make me a logo and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, so sure, I can do a market research and I can see it. I prefer to hire somebody else and, and to do this for me, digest it and give it to me. The, you know, that has the expertise for that. Um, he, you know, it's, it's so interesting, even just learning about that fact about Russia and the business dealings. Um, yeah, I wonder if that even extends into like, b2b you're sending an email campaign it has a bunch of people smiling you know um but you know what's also funny now i don't know whether to smile or not when i'm talking to you <laughs> my, my wife always says, <laughs> you know in, in family photos my wife always says like why is everybody so serious but right. my russian family looks at her and they're like what does she do like that like, okay they're like you married uh, a crazy family <laughs> yeah Oh man, yeah. you know what? It's funny. I, I was once, I worked for a company in the U S that was owned by a company in Belgium and they, uh, they were dictating the marketing campaigns for us to send. And so mm -hmm. they would routinely send us the campaigns mistakes. Yeah. You know, like the problem with that is a different English, you know, like British yeah. English versus the U S we're spelling stuff in Canada. We're spelling Z's with Z's and all sorts of different things are different. Uh, but I remember the funniest thing they sent me was this marketing email campaign to send to every one of our U.S. customers. And it said, happy gooseberry season. And I'm like, what's a gooseberry? I've never heard of a gooseberry. Really? It's the big berries, right? Yeah. It's okay. Green. I guess so. You see, hey, it worked for you, but I we don't have gooseberries, or if we do, it's not a thing. There's no gooseberry season. Definitely, you know, yeah. A gooseberry, like if you want to be silly, you could. So that would be the equivalent of being a clown over there because you're like, happy gooseberry season. It's almost like saying, you know, hey, happy hug a secretary day or something. That's that's even a little bit easier than a gooseberry. And they're like, no, yeah. you must send this thing out. <laughs> Why? No one's gonna, no one's gonna get it. That makes a lot of sense. But yeah, you gotta, you gotta change and you gotta adapt to the different places you're at. And to your point. Um, I once I flew through China one time and I was just still in the airport. But it was funny, pretty much half of my world was shut down because I was using Gmail for email. That's yep. not working. Yep. Facebook, that's not working. I was pretty much down to using Yahoo and <laughs> it just uh, kind of I don't know, listening to music, you know? Yeah, yeah. Ah, it's so yeah. interesting. You gotta you gotta know the company. And you got to do the research, got to put the time in. And to your point, you know, hire some people that have domain expertise in that area. Absolutely. Um, and of course, that would be yet another, not myth, but a problem in the sales world. Yeah. Salespeople are very cocky. They're very self-confident. Yeah. They're very yeah. full of themselves. <laughs> Tell um, me. So the, worst, 
<laughs> oh, of course it is. And the worst place ever to be in, I'm assuming, would be a sales convention. That's ridiculous. Everybody are <laughs> trained to sell to each other. Oh. Listening. And then yeah. like, you leave and you're like, ah, I told you, like, I showed them. <laughs> it's very hard yeah. in, in, in sales uh, as a company to do things right. No wonder nine out of ten companies are going bankrupt. Right. Sales is a process, mm. and this process involves different departments. Yep. Uh, like for example, I, I've been to many companies where the engineering is the one that dictates sales. Mm. An engineer comes up to sales and they say, "This is the product." Sales say, "Listen, the market say that the product needs to be adapted a little bit better." Right. But the engineer says, "Listen, this is the product. Sell it, and that's it." Um, so same goes for market research and for engineering. It's a tough game. Sales is a tough game. Right. You know, it's interesting. There's a company in the U S called drift. I don't know if you heard of them. They, they do like chat. Yeah. It's just, it's interesting. It's kind of a retake on chat. So, um, it, you know, if you get to a website pops up a thing and, and it to start with, it's like AI, it's a robot that talks to you at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So that way you don't have a bunch of humans talking to a bunch of people that don't want to talk to you. And, but eventually if you're, if you're just typing or clicking the path to follow, there's different paths that will take you down. Um, it can also answer questions for you. But if you're just like, you know what? I want a human automatically drops a human in place. Who's like, hi, how can I help you? So there's, it's, it's a cool, it's a cool technology. It's out of Cambridge. It's pretty popular. But the reason I bring them up is because it's probably about two months ago. They had this big post where, uh, all their users were saying, we really, really want this feature, like feature X, whatever it is. And they had already mapped out their engineering plan for like a year, you know, or at least a couple quarters. But, what, but because they got so much feedback from that, they actually scrapped all the plans and they said, we're going to do this feature now. We're going to do this first and it'll be out in like in two weeks. And it was like, a re that was a, a really cool thing because normally companies don't, they're not, they're not agile enough to do that. They're not listening maybe mm -hmm. where they don't have the power in the right place to really advocate for the customer. Absolutely. And, and you know, like if you have that ability to, to answer the market needs uh, quickly, yeah. that's the name of the game. That's the you, name know, of the game. you know, and that kind of ties into like your book in, and uh, you know, I know there's a different, we can talk about some of the things that are in there, but you know, why did you write that? Was that just sort of, you're getting a lot of questions, you want to answer them or what, what, because it usually. I wrote the, like I wrote the book because. Go ahead. I wrote this, I wrote this book for, for a very, very simple reason. Yeah. I'm, I'm a lot into self-education. So there's a lot of guys that I'm following and they're reading and uh, there's Gary V and yeah. Grant Cardone and Keenan and I can continue the list endlessly. I'm a big fan. Yeah. All of those guys, they're offering uh, a very special, specific insight into sales. Uh, do this, do this one thing. This, I would call this like an advanced learner uh, books. They are the next level. They're like the, the university of sales. But I'm coming from the field and I've noticed that so many, and I'm talking about like so many people that are in sales, in marketing, CEOs of companies, of small businesses, of startups, yeah. they have no idea about basics. Yeah. They have no idea about basics. I'm talking literally every day, every single day, I talk to at least five different C-level uh, people all over the globe that are saying, we don't need strategy, we don't believe in marketing, we don't need leads, uh, we don't need cold calling. We, people say, I just want to see money. Right. That's the bottom line. But then you say, listen, to see money, you first need to be meeting people. Right. To meet people, you need to be calling people. To call people, you need to mail people or generate enough interest on your social media or your website. Right. People like completely oblivious to this. They don't know. They're like, people don't even know what lead generation is. Uh, right. People don't know the difference between a lead and a prospect. And where do you get those leads? How do you get those leads? Uh, so many people, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of social selling. So many people are, are into social selling. Yeah. And by social selling, they mean that they sit in the office on Facebook all day long. And then when <laughs> their management says, what is it that you're doing? Like, oh, social selling. But it doesn't work. It sounds like a Dude, myth right there. 
Smash dude, that. Dude, like, dude, watching viral videos on Facebook is not social selling. No. <laughs> uh, clicking not. likes to your friend's post isn't social selling. Social selling is when you, on social media, bring value to yeah. other people, to other businesses. And you know what? Even if it's your face daily, but the words coming out of your face actually benefit other people, Yeah, that would be social selling. Talking about yourself is not. There's another thing, and by the way, here's marketing. There you go. Yeah. If it's just your face next to your kid's face, next to your wife's face, well, maybe that's called brand exposure. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's amount of things. Yeah. If you do 90% brand and 10% value, you're not social selling. Mm. You're in marketing and the product that you're marketing sucks. <laughs> because that's not how you do it. Right. There's a ratio, you know, the ratio is like, I know, 80% value, 20% right. exposure of some sort. There will be social selling. I like that. 20% exposure, 80% value. That's the real social selling. It could be as simple as your face. It doesn't have to be some grand thing, some super edited thing. It's your face and the words coming out of your mouth have value for the person Absolutely. watching it. Absolutely. Right. Because, you know, people, uh, people are, will be watching this or listening to this or, yeah. or whatever. Uh, people don't expect from you to have Hollywood effects in your in your videos. Um, right. All the all the really important influencers that, that that I've seen, they literally take a phone and they shoot themselves for thirty seconds, forty seconds, and and the message is out there. You know, mm -hmm. I try to do that myself. I'm not an influencer, God forbid. I'm like, uh, but I do have enough of a crowd and enough to recognize me on the streets, um, enough to send me emails. Um, and every once in a while, when there's a stupid hater that writes something like, dude, stop posting those videos or something like that, I have 20 people bashing him on the <laughs> same post saying, no, 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 keep posting. We want to hear what you have to say. Yeah, don't listen to this guy. He's an idiot. You can block him now. <laughs> well, I'm blocking people. Absolutely. You know, and, you know, for every 99 normal people, there's always one crazy person <laughs> who's oh, smiling absolutely. for a long time, right? <laughs> absolutely. There you go. Don't smile. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're going to give a lot of people pause. You know, they're like, huh, should I be smiling? Yes, you should be smiling. Just not when you go to Russia for business meetings. Um, or Ukraine. Or, 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 yeah. or the entire region. Okay. All right. Good, good to know. Just, you, know, you see a lot of photos, too, where people are just, you know, straight faced. And, oh, you know what is interesting? Um, doing a passport photo for the U.S., uh, there's a, there are, like, rules you have to follow. And one of them was no smiling when you can't show teeth, which to me felt weird because I was like, but, but I, what if I want to smile? So I kind of snuck a smirk in there and it passed the test. So I have a little bit of a, like a, you know, I don't know. Anyways, it, I got a little, a little Casey smile in there, but for the most part, you had to be all serious, you know? Um, yeah. That, yeah. Oh, it's interesting. And, you know, one other thing you brought up the, you know, you don't have to have that high production value that, you know, that studio doing this and that, it's really, it's, it's changed a lot. It, you know, in the past, especially for video, you know, video, and I know you're doing videos on, on YouTube and they're, they're showing up on LinkedIn and people are, are just like, thank you because value came out and that was the important part. And I think we're, we're getting to realizing that that's the important part. Like you and I were chatting, we're in our offices, we got our cool artwork and we're just hanging out. Um, and it, and it, and as long as we're giving people value and we're not just here pitching our own stuff all the time, then, you know, Absolutely. that's, that's the social selling. That's providing value. That's, that's the Absolutely. right thing. It doesn't, we don't need to be Absolutely. in a crazy studio and more and more people can start doing this now because it doesn't require some crazy level, you know, a whole studio. Yeah. 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 And there's like, uh, that goes to the next step. I, I met with this company. They're fantastic. The company is a manufacturer. They okay. manufacture a, a DIY product, and they have in-house video production team. It's actually five people. They have a lot of equipment. They have a lot of wow. drones, and they have about 600 professional videos all over platforms. And they're selling all over the world. Uh, their products are fantastic. Wow. 
And then they have the sales people, okay? The consumer, when they sell B2C, when they sell through websites or through retailer, the consumer goes to the company's webpage yep. and checks out those professional videos and they buy the stuff, okay? Yep. That's the B2C. However, once the sales management shows up to a meeting when it's a B2B, when this manufacturer tries to put their goods on a shelf, on a huge retailer, that management isn't going to look at their product. The first thing that the management is going to do is going to go onto the LinkedIn page of the people they're about to meet. They're going to Google them and they're going to check out videos of the people, yeah. not of the product. Right. Meaning, if you're interested to sell your products to consumers, have a professional camera, take still, still take whatnot, Instagram and so on. Hmm. But, but know that at the end of the day, if you're going to sell massive quantities, if you're going to B2B, if you go into a meeting, the first thing that people do our days is to Google you. They want to see who you are. They're going to go to LinkedIn and they're going to see what kind of posts do you have? What is it that you're talking about in your right. videos? They're going to go right. to your Facebook page and your YouTube page. They don't care if it's professional or not. Um, right. unless, unless this is your job. Unless your job is to be a video producer. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, yeah. that's different. But if you're a simple guy and you're into selling goods or services or products, all people care about, they don't, they don't even notice your background, you know? Yeah. Um, all, all the people care about is value. And right. we as salespeople obviously care about the value we bring to other people as well. It's so much easier when you're in sales to sell to somebody who wants your stuff. And the way yeah. the other person, the, the way the other person would want to buy your stuff is if he sees the value. Right. So our job is to just show value, mm. show the value of the product, and show the value of ourselves as the salesperson. You know that's interesting because it it that's the right way, but so many times we think the op the opposite, which is it's our it's almost like sales guys get a bad rap because th when they try to trick people. It, and they're not, they're not thinking about value. They're thinking, I got to get you to make this decision. But the decision will be made if you can just show the value to the person, but also to the organization. Absolutely. Show, Absolutely. Like, feeling the value. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, like a very brief example, if you'd like. Yeah. Uh, I, show, I show up to this company and the company sent close to 600 cold mails to customers. And that's zero responses. <laughs> zero. Let but that be I a lesson to at, everyone. <laughs> can I have a look at the mail? So I look at the mail, and the mail is obviously like 10 paragraphs with a spec attached to it, a technical sheet. Jeez. And they're trying to get a distributor. They're trying to get a distributor in all of those countries in Europe for their product. So they're saying, here's the product, here's what it does, here's the specification, and attach C drawings. I'm like, okay, yeah. now let's delete all of that. Yeah. And start from scratch. And you start by saying, hi, my name is. Yeah. Here's my profile in LinkedIn. I work for this company. And what I'm trying to sell is this product that I know will bring you money if you sell it. Right. That's it. One line. My product will bring you money if you sell it. You buy it from me for five bucks. You'll be selling it for 20 bucks. And you'll have a huge line of buyers because I know that it works. Here's a proof. Here's social proof. Here's yeah. what people are saying about my product on Facebook. Yeah. Boom. Pretty cool. much the next week, they start getting like uh, hot leads income. And people are like, I want to buy. I want to be a distributor. I want to sign a deal. Really? I want to come you, over. Did you send another version of the, of the direct mail, of that, that physical mail? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Instead of, all of this, instead of all of this crap about me, 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 my company, my company, my product, my product, my product, I'm like, you're going to make money by selling this product. Right. Here's the product. Here's the proof. Here's me. That's it. Like literally four have, lines. I don't know if you have it, but it'd be awesome if you, you should probably keep for yourself like the before and after, you know, of, of here's what, here's what it looked like. Maybe you blur out the, the low, but that's, it's so, wow. I mean, me, 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 it's all saying me, right? Me, me, me. Here's the specs. Me, me, me. This is what the product does. And this is all about you. Yeah, what's in it? It all start. It's it's all starts so wrong. Like you know, yeah. uh, usually when you bring in a new sales guy into a company that sells I don't know machinery or shoes, it doesn't matter what. Right. What is the first thing that you do? 
the first thing that you do is you teach the sales guy about the product. And if it's a complex product, then you're going to go into the specifications and into the technical data. And mm -hmm. you, the guy, the guy will end up, uh, the salesperson, this new guy, yeah. will end up learning for like six months about, about the product. Right. So when you'll try to sell, he's going to try to sell the specifications. So he'll be talking about the product. But this person in front of him doesn't, doesn't care. No. Why? It's the 21st century. So just like you, there's a hundred others in line talking about their products. Why would they care? I care about myself. I care about making money. And the way for you to sell to me is by telling me how I am going to make a profit of you. Right. So instead, when a new sales guy shows up, the first thing that you say is the first look, number one, you say, by selling this product, you will make this much profit. This is why. Here's the proof. Go sell. If they need more data, they can talk to our engineering department. Right. Yeah, it's almost like learn about the customer. Learn about the result first. Like details, you of can course. always find out. No big deal. <laughs> but And this, this is like yeah. a very arguable approach. So many people argue about this. There's a few very specific fields uh, in which uh, the end consumer is looking to the salesperson as the professional in the field. Right. So you obviously need to know a lot about it. Uh, so whatever I just said doesn't doesn't negate the fact that you, of course, need to know about your product. Obviously, right. you right. cannot be selling something and the consumer is going to be like, "So what does this do?" And they'll be like, well, "I don't know. I have to call engineering." But right. by the way, it's better if you have to choose. You need to know more about the product, the competitors, the benefits that the, the consumer will get in the B two B. You know. Um, because the B2C yeah. is obviously slightly different, but still the same concept. Still the same concept. You know, like this if is... you look at them, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go no, ahead. No, no, no. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. No, no, no. <laughs> That's awesome. Are you going to give me another example? Uh, in the B2C, my favorite example in the B2C is obviously the iPhone, you know? Um... Uh, if, you look at all the, if you look at all the Android devices, they're fantastic. Every like the flagships, uh, the Samsung, LG, even like uh, all, all the slightly down, like the, yeah. the One and the Google phone, they're all fantastic. And they right. all talk about their specifications. They have so much gigabytes of RAM. They have so much of storage. Yeah. The yeah. camera is so many megapixels. Now, if you compare the spec sheets, the iPhone is a crappy phone. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea why would somebody be buying it. I know, right? And luckily, dude, come on. It but feels luckily, so good though, right? You just, mm. No, no. Yes. It's embarrassing. Don't, don't show this on camera. Anyway. <laughs> I'm smiling. The, and is, the reason <laughs> why you have this is because of Apple's marketing machine. Mm. They, they take you away from spec specifications. They say, who cares about how many megapixels the camera is? Who cares about the storage? Right. Fine. So we have less. So who cares? We give you a better experience. Right. Now it's obviously a myth and it's obviously bullshit because I don't Apple know, but I like it. Just try something once. Just give it a try. Yeah. You you won't I, believe that you use an iPhone. I just like the, believe it. I like the icons better and everything. It just feels right. You can change the, the way the icons look on any can Android you? machine. Of course. Hmm. You can change the entire interface. You can, can be like circles or squares or triangles, yeah. you name it. Yeah. You can even take your phone, go to the, buyer, to the Pirate Bay, download the movie straight to your phone and watch it on your phone. Go to a book <laughs> store and download the book into your phone. You can go to a music place like a torrent or a magnet link and download music straight to your phone and listen to, to your music on your phone. You don't need to be connecting it to any iTunes. You don't need to convert it. Any Android phone plays like 20 different formats, all the formats. So the only reason to have an iPhone is there's no reason, but the marketing is fantastic. The experience, you're, I have an iPhone. You know, in places like Russia, people like have two phones. They have an iPhone that they pull out of their pocket and put on the table to show that they have an iPhone. <laughs> the real phone that they're using, not like a Samsung that they use as a phone. Right. With all the, yeah. all the details on it. Maybe they'll watch videos yeah. on the other one. 
Huh. Uh, probably no, not even even then, no, right? Better yeah. better screen, better everything else. Huh. That I mean that's a good point, right? What like why you know, why one versus another? And you know, it would make sense for them then too to put specs on there to say, Look, your phone is a piece of shit. Like come over here and get this amazing phone. You can have double the battery life and you can zoom in it's you know for you know three times so when it's ca- so so this is like a great example you know when yeah. you do, when you look at when you look at apple or iphone yeah. versus android then the android says we have better specification which is true but then when you look at all the uh, android manufacturers like why would you choose a new samsung and not a new lj and not a new one x and not right. a new google phone yeah. they all have the same specifications so what's right. the difference so they compete in price and they try to compete in like better warranties, but it's a hard competition, you know? Interesting. Yeah. Cause they're, and they're not, they're not trying to do the experience thing. And then how do you differentiate yourself? But doesn't this seem like back to the days of Dell and HP and compact who just sold like the cheapest computers ever. And then Apple came along and was like this thing, instead of being $300, it's a thousand. But look, it's got a smooth surface and, you know, I don't know, in a, in a, in a holistic experience. Either way, they, they, they've separated the two markets for sure. They're all trying to do, they're all trying to do their own different techniques. Like uh, I was a big fan of a company called HTC. HTC, yeah. back in the day when everybody was doing plastic, they were doing metal bodies. And they had like all shiny and sparkly phones, like magnificent. A crappy user experience. I dumped them. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Looked um, good, but wasn't wasn't good enough. No, no, it just looked good. Which Killer. also brings us to yet another uh, evolution of marketing into sales. Okay. Marketing, marketing will be able to push any item on you. Like you have an iPhone because of marketing, not because of sales. You didn't went into a store and the iPhone was cheaper, or you had a sales guy. No. You have an iPhone because of marketing, pure marketing experience. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So that's marketing. Now imagine you buying your iPhone and it keeps crashing all the time and it doesn't have enough space and it doesn't do what it's supposed to be doing. Then what? Then you no longer will use the product. So in our day, in our age, sales need to closely follow up after marketing, meaning you actually have to deliver on your promise. Whatever it is that you promise in your marketing campaign, in your marketing material, in your marketing spec, that needs to be followed through. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You got to deliver on the promise. And especially in B2B marketing and sales, there's some kind of human interaction that's going to be happening. And you want to promise the world on one side and it gets over here on this other side and it's different. You don't deliver I, I was, expectations and you didn't fulfill them. Absolutely. You know, I, I uh, worked with this Chinese manufacturer of a, a specific uh, garden equipment. Okay. And that is fantastic commercial showing that their garden and equipment is indestructible. Nothing wow. happens to it. So a lot of people said, listen, I want a garden equipment that doesn't go bad. Because, you know, like usually you have to renew it uh, every it's year rusty. or two. Yeah, Paul, yeah. It's rusty. So, so they got it. And this thing didn't even last it for a season. Uh-huh. It was damaged by sun to the breaking point, meaning <laughs> under direct sunlight, it became breakable. No way. So you, like, you like touch the thing and it breaks apart because of sun. So like you can drive over it with a Mack truck, nothing happens. You can put it in, in you know, you can freeze it in sub-zero temperatures, nothing happens. Right. You leave it out in the right. sun for an afternoon and the thing falls apart. Oh, the thing man. falls apart. The thing becomes flexible. You flick it, and it falls apart. Really? Like a little, like a yep. little garden shovel or something. You just little yep. Yep. crumbles. Yep. Was it yep. like a like a plastic or something? What? Why was it? It so- was plastic. Yeah, it was a composite of plastic. Jeez, probably good to you. Know, they should change the marketing to be these are recyclable garden tools. Use them once and then but, bury them in your garden. <laughs> but you know, like so many mistakes are are fantastic. I, I came back from uh, an expo. Uh, in which a new composite of plastic and wood was shown. Okay. Uh, imagine it does like it looks like wood, uh, but it actually is also pressed with plastic. So it looks fantastic. Oh. It's very durable and very 
um, weather, it can withstand weather conditions. And sunlight. Based on, based on the marketing <laughs> material. Right. Six months later, it turns that the wood in this composite rots very fast and there's nothing you can do. So it literally dismantles. So if you have like, uh, whatever, I'm not going to mention the product. Right. But if you have a product made out of this material, the product falls by itself, falls apart. It rots away. Same company as the other thing? As the one that... No, no, no. no oh, okay. Because no, that would have been like two strikes and you're out. Like, all right, you're done. No, no, no. The, the first company was out after strike one. Like uh, They were? People... Yeah, yeah, yeah. People don't have patience for stuff like Did that. Did they try to hire you to fix it for them and they had to just rebrand everything? They tried to hire me to prevent this from happening. Okay. They didn't listen to my advice. Really? They just wanted to like, take it to market before it was ready and... I mean, I, I, can't, I can't believe someone uh, well, didn't figure out that sunlight, I mean, it, there's no sun in a factory, I guess, but. Well, no, actually in plastic, it's a known phenomena, uh, especially really? in polycarbonate, in polycarbonate sheets, uh, they need to be UV protected. Otherwise they become fragile and they break. And the way you see that they break is if this hail, hail literally punctures through. So if you have a garden gazebo, if you have a carport, if you have a garden shed made out of a, cheap crappy polycarbonate that wasn't uv treated yeah. you'll get it breaking um so if you take it to a bigger magnitude and you make something bigger and heavier out of it it's gonna happen for sure wow so a lot of manufacturers it's a manufacturer's thing that they're trying to do they're trying to go to market manufacturing is a long process you have the planning and you have the all of all of the everything around by the time you get the money and the funding and you start making the item you want to you wanna make money, you want to sell, you want to push. And a lot of them are pushing a product when it's not ready, be it something made out of a plastic or be it in agriculture. In right. agriculture, it happens a lot, a lot. Huh. When people harvest things before it's ready. Right. Yeah. Have you ever seen tomatoes that were uh, kind of half, gray, half uh, green, half red? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you seen that? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you know this or not, but tomatoes are usually harvested when they're green. Right. And then they mature during transit. Right. In proper conditions. So by the time they arrive, they're red. However, if you harvest them too early during transit, they're going to mature and then they're going to stop. So that's how you get a half red, half green tomato. That means that the farmer was too eager to get paid. So he harvested it. Right. They didn't get the timing right. They, it was too early and, and it, it went halfway. It was too early because he yeah. wants to sell. He wants to sell badly. Right. It happens a lot. It happens a lot with mangoes um, or a lot of uh, pineapple that they're just being harvested and shipped. And then you get a hard rock mango that won't ripe. Interesting. Um, or for you as a consumer, that's really irrelevant. So you bought right. yourself a mango. Big right. deal. I personally seen in Rotterdam a ship full of mango, a ship, um, costing like, I don't know, three, four million euros, arriving to Rotterdam with those hard rock mangoes that have been put in specific rooms called uh, ripening rooms. Yeah. Where using ethylene gas and temperature, they ripen them within 24 hours. Really? And shipping a red, yeah. And shipping ready to eat mango to supermarkets. So you're buying a supermarket already a ready to eat fruit. 40% of a shipload is being dumped. Wow. 40 or zero wow. of a ship. If you're the guy that bought that ship, you'll be very pissed. That's a <laughs> lot of money. Yeah. Why did that happen? The guys that sent you the mangoes, they want to get paid. They can't right. wait to get paid. Right. So once it happens, twice it happens for the third time, you're not going to be buying their mangoes anymore. Nope. They know that. They don't care. They want to make money now. They, they don't think that uh, long term, really? even if that long term is going to be happening in like six months, they don't care. They want to get paid. Wow. Because we, we just talked about like it's going to go on the groups like, hey, don't buy mangoes from this supplier. You know, right. They, they just want right. the money. And they have hard, hard melons. Right. Well, specifically in this industry, it's very complex because you have a small farmer that has 100 trees. Uh, he sells to yeah. a bigger distribution company within his country. That bigger company sells to a uh, multinational, be it Del Monte right. or Chiquita, somebody like that that sells all over. 
Right. Uh, you probably know Driscoll's berries, right? Driscoll berries. I don't think so. World's, world's largest manufacturer of berries called Driscoll's. Oh, oh Driscoll's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Driscoll's. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's like so a worldwide, just, huh? I didn't even realize that. Right. I thought they were so local. I just came back from <laughs> Europe. I was just uh, in Switzerland, Belgium, and Holland. So if you go to, a, to Germany, on the shelf, you have Driscoll berries. That berries came to Germany from Amsterdam. Wow. From, uh, to Amsterdam, it came from Rotterdam, to where it was flown from New York, to where it was flown from Mexico. And all of that happened in less than 24 hours. Field in Mexico, shelf in Germany, five stops along the way, five different legs. Wow. I That's a B to B to B to B to C. B to B to B to B to B to C. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I it then, thought they were local. <laughs> Driscoll, yeah, no, the multinational world's largest company that deals with berries. No kidding. Jeez. Same, same as uh, like Del Monte, you know, Del Monte. Yeah. Uh, the one of the world's largest dealers in bananas and pineapples. So their management sits in Miami. The guys that are in charge of the import sit in Belgium, in the port. Really? And they sell all over Europe. But so the way they do it is they purchase it. From Miami, they purchased it from Costa Rica. Right. From Costa Rica, it's shipped down to the States. From the States, it's shipped to Belgium, to Antwerp port. From Antwerp, by truck, it's either trucked back to Rotterdam for inspection and then to Germany. So they, it's a B2B2B in which they're selling to themselves. Right. And then to C, which is the supermarket, and then to B2C to again. Right. So international business... Uh, an international trade is somewhat more complex than a one-on-one -on -one interaction. But all of this chain has as much in common as me uh, meeting a guy at an expo and selling my own services. Right. And the basic is you still need that marketing material. People need to hear about you. Yep. People need to hear about your services. Know who you are, what you offer, why you're better. And right. by the way, you're better personally. Because at the end of the day, for example, you sell the same products or the same services as the, as the next guy. Right. For the same price, same level of service. The only thing that is different between you and the guy is you. You're the <laughs> difference. Right. You're the difference. Huh. So at the end of the day, your buyer is going to buy from you because he likes your face. Right. Or because, you know, like he likes the way your wife looks on Facebook or something sure. like that. Sure. Uh, because the product costs the same or even cheaper at the next guys. True. So that's marketing. You need to have that. You need to be out. The word about you need to be out. You need to be producing valuable content. Right. And then sales. And then sales because there's a big difference between sales and order gathering. Order mm -hmm. gathering is if you put a, a LinkedIn video or YouTube video and then you cross your hands and you kick back in your chair and you're like, <laughs> waiting for the phone to ring. Right. But we're in sales. We don't do that. That's right. We pick up the phone and we call people. Uh, we cold call. We cold mail. And sometimes when people don't answer, you know what? Like back in the 60s, you get on the plane or get in your car and you go knock on doors. Right. And you burst into people's offices. And that works because people are so amazed that someone is still doing that that they're actually going to get you into a meeting. Right. You know? What are they going to say? No. <laughs> yeah, and if you, and if, if you plan your road trip properly, that if this guy says no, or this guy's in a meeting, or yeah. this guy's unavailable, you're supposed to have a meeting next door. So if in one yeah. road trip you plan yourself 20 meetings and you end up having only 10, 10 meetings is fantastic. Totally. If you get 10 meetings, you need to have like 100 mails sent out. Yeah. You know, so. Yep. Interesting. You know, it, it's interesting. I looked at Driscoll's website and they don't have gooseberries. So I. I feel I feel good, but I, I'm on the I'm on the American side of their uh, website, so maybe that's what it is. I just um, had gooseberries in Belgium. I, I love gooseberries. You just see, I have, gooseberries, I need, yeah. I need I need to go get one apparently. No, no, no. It's a very uh, taste dependent thing. I'm not oh, sure. Okay. If you've okay. never had one, don't don't have one. So you're saying I smile too much? I probably won't like it. <laughs> nah, I have like red, like I know gooseberries. Bitter bitter berries of of Europe. <laughs> uh, they're probably bitter because of the soccer, too. <laughs> probably, probably. I used to live in the UK, so I, was the, I used to be a big fan of Manchester United. Oh, yeah. But since, but since then, I'm not that much into football. Yeah, and I mean, it's going on right now, too, and I was, you know, 
obviously France crushed Belgium, but I couldn't believe Croatia beat England. I mean, all these little upstarts. That's funny. That's what happens. That's what, that's, is what that, happens. that's exactly what happens. Or the fact that Croatia beat Russia, you know, like how does that happen? Uh, people getting cocky. And every time you're getting mm-hmm. cocky and you think that you're the big shot in the neighborhood, right? you're going to go down. Yeah. Like Xerox, like Nokia. Yeah. Do you remember Nokia? Yeah. You, you had only Nokia. That's it. No, mm-hmm. There's no other phone. Yeah. You had Nokia and then you had what? Ooh, Siemens? Who did, nobody. Nokia. Nobody. Nobody. Yeah. And now what? They're... Now there's a thousand different kinds. No, but now they're gone. Now, now they're, now they're gone. gone. Are, they, are they really gone gone or are they just like a small player? Yeah. Now they're a small company probably owned by Chinese, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. And they, you know, they, they manufacture like three devices for kids. Right. right. Sad. Well, you know, this has been cool, man. You know, who are you? Uh, you, know, how, you have all these experiences, and, and you really have this experience with the, in the international business scene, which is really interesting to hear about. Um, you know, in, it sounds like you, you, know, you started in Russia. You know, just take us back. Like, wh- what kind of things have you experienced along the way that really shaped you know, who you are, how you got into sales eventually, and all that? Okay. Uh, I was eight years old when I came to Israel with my mom. Uh, okay. Just me and her. Just me and her. And uh, back in the day, when I was coming here, the Soviet government would, co- would confiscate all of your property and your passports uh, at the border. So they say, you want to leave the Soviet Union? Leave, but you're leaving empty-handed. Nothing. Wow. So we came to a new country with nothing. Really? Just like, the clothes. No, just the nothing. clothes? You don't even have your Russian nothing. passports or IDs or anything? No, no. They would confiscate. They would strip you away off your citizenship, take away all of your high school and university diplomas because uh, the state gave you the education so you'd come with nothing, okay? Wow. So I show up to Israel and I was aware of that. And uh, pretty much, you know, like uh, six months into our new life here, I, I had some kind of friends, you know, in uh, third grade and I wanted to have some money. Uh, but dude, right? we just came and we, we barely can feed ourselves, barely. Yeah. So like, I, and I knew that I'm not going to go to my mom and ask for money. That was ridiculous. Right. I, was right. nine, I was probably nine years old. I would never ask her for money because that's ridiculous. Right. So I went to do market research to see who makes money and whom can I compete at the age wow. of nine. Wow. So I went to this very touristy area on the beach, on the front walk. Okay. And I saw that there's a lot of like toys made out of uh, shells. You know, like the little souvenir toys that you yeah. have made out of shells. I'm like, okay, I can do that. So I went and I got myself a small tube of super glue that cost like nothing. I don't even remember where did I got the coin to get it. Hmm. Then I went to the beach with an empty cardboard box and I gathered shells and then I glued myself a bunch of those toys. I made like a little Pac-Man out of shells wow. with bunnies. And like I found a starfish and like made a bunch of that. I went to the promenade and within 30 minutes, I sold a full crate and made like, made like a, a dude, like a, probably a, like a third of a monthly paycheck, uh, wow. an average monthly paycheck for an adult. But wow. Whoa, right. <laughs> that was like so half an was, hour. So that was many lessons that I learned. Yeah. If you want something, Go get it. Go get Nobody it. Nobody owes you shit. Right. Do it yourself. Go get it. B, proper planning, followed yeah. by a proper follow-up. Yeah. And a proper execution will inevitably get you the result. If you plan, and if you follow the plan, and you execute it, you'll get the result. It, it, it's like physics. Sure, there's right. forces of nature, but... If you check the market, you see that there's buyers for those goods. You can make the same. You as a salesperson, more attractive because I'm a nine-year-old boy hustling everybody with a crate. Of course, they're going to buy from you and not from a touristy thing. Yeah. And I'm also like 50% cheaper. Of course. Better I, story. Those better are price. the lessons that last like up until today. I follow all of those lessons. Wow. A week later, I was doing this under the sun, so I came back very sunburned, you know? Right. And my mom got very pissed, and she shut me down. She said, it doesn't matter what? the money. You have enough money to last you for years. 
I'm not gonna let you be anymore. Like because sunburn, of the like, sunburn, dude. Like I was in the sun for like hours. Oh, okay. So, so you very, were like, you're like a tomato. <laughs> I was like a tomato, very bad. Yeah. And that's another valuable lesson. Make sure to avoid management. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> management. Management will shut down any initiative, even if it's profitable, if they have a somewhat else opinion other than right. yours. Right. You bring profit, you show the profit, you generate income. The management, for some reason, disagrees with your tactics. They're going to shut you down. So Always true. remember the management. <laughs> Always remember the management or avoid yeah. the management. But, but either way. So that was me. Uh, then I grew up like pretty much any other kid. But unlike any other kid, I worked throughout all summer vacations. Totally. Uh, from the age of nine, because I needed the money. Yep. And if I wanted to go to a movie or to go do anything that required money, if I wanted to get a Burger King or, or go to somewhere, I, I would have to pay for that. Right. So to pay for that, needed the money. Work. And then, Sounds like, like you learned from an year. early age that like, you need to, you, know, you said already, but earn it, but you need to do the work to get what you want. It's, there's no magical fairy delivering Burger King to your doorstep. You know, like you went, you spent some time, you worked hard, you got some money and, and then you get the chance to reward yourself. So you built in that feedback loop that sometimes people say that, you know, the younger generations don't necessarily have, but you er learn that early on because you wanted to go to a movie, but you weren't going to let, you know, not having money stop you. You're just going to go find the money so you could go to the movie. Yep. Yeah. Pretty much like everybody else, you know, that, yeah. that's the only logical where I'm very logical and very sure. like into like analytics. So this is what needs to be done. Um, so grow a pair and go do what needs to be done. You right. Know? And then I ended up in the army just like any uh, other Israeli. <laughs> yeah. uh, right. A lot of them, a lot of them are avoiding draft, but most go to the army. Isn't um, it mandatory? There's some sort of mandatory service. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, it is. Uh, but our days, it's somewhat easy to, to get out. Oh, is it? Uh, okay. Yeah. Back in my day, it was much harder, but back in my day, nobody wanted to. So right. my, every single classmate of mine ended up in the military. Um, I ended up in the Air Force. Uh, 119 Tactical Bombing Squadron. Not that it means anything to anyone. Right. But yeah. Uh, three years of that. And then another 20 years of reserves. Yeah. Uh, in Israel, up until the age of 50, some you go 40, it depends where which unit you're in. Um, you go in roughly for a month, a year. Wow. So, the, for a solid month, or is it like, because in the US it's like a, a weekend every month kind yes. of? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Then you can send them, like, come over for three days, and you have a business meeting, and you have like a trip planned abroad. Yep. Nobody cares. You're off to the army. <laughs> yeah. Right. Off you go. Yep. You know, it's you go. Yeah, sometimes I, it's kind of torn because I, there's a real value. You know, I got out of, you know, my experience too. And but I saw a lot of kids that were younger than me. They, you know, a lot of them, we maybe didn't have, you know, good growth, you know, family or good whatnot. They, they, they grew up, they matured because of it. And I thought, man, you know, a lot of us could benefit from that. But at the same time, we also benefited from having people that actually wanted to be there. And you're not around a bunch of idiots that, or just complaining the whole time because they don't actually want to. Oh, we complain anyways, but we complain, but we all chose it early no, on. We said, no, yeah, no, 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 you know? no complaining, no complaining. Right. I'll give you another story about my childhood. Do you care? Do you want to hear it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So my grandpa, he's still alive. Uh, he, by the way, came to Israel with my grandma, my mom's okay. parents. They, they're pretty young, hip, 90-year-old couple. Nice. Up until the age of 85, my grandpa would compete with me on push-ups on knuckles <laughs> till the age of 85. He would kick my ass every single time. He'd be like, oh, you lift weights? Come on, let's do some push-ups and pull-ups. Till he was 85, he would kick my ass. So my grandpa is a data transmission electronics engineer. Huh. He wrote his PhD about the way uh, satellites communicate to relays on the surface. Okay, so that's wow. not your typical grandpa. Right. He was a general in the Red Army, and he commanded uh, the base that had interballistic missiles pointing at New York and Washington. No kidding. 
And then, yeah, he was in the missile forces of the Soviet Union. Right. Then when he retired from the Red Army because of his PhD, he became a professor of uh, data transmission devices in a major university in wow. Kiev, Ukraine, the International University. So the guy is very achieved PhD, commanded dozens of thousands of people, right. a general, yeah. PhD, an engineer, a professor. He shows up to Israel. And he speaks two languages. He speaks like a little bit of German and Russian. He shows up to Israel and he was somewhat, I don't know, not that old. Was, uh, probably 60, okay? Yeah. So he's still employable and he has a lot of to give. So he shows up to the governmental uh, employment office. And they say, so what can you do? So he says, well, I can fix anything from a VCR to a satellite. Uh, I know how to build a mobile communication network in case of a nuclear strike <laughs> i can i know all about inter like you name it yeah and this is my education and this is my diplomas and everything and they said we have the perfect job for you uh -oh. <laughs> and they sent him to cut down dead trees in the forest with convicts wow that's a mess. Because, <laughs> because, you know, for various reasons, that was the, the way you would, um, that's, that was the way you would treat an immigrant uh, uh -huh. in Israel back at the day. Got it. Okay? But Grandpa smiled, gave everybody the finger, <laughs> and said, I survived so many different things that this is a joke. And I'll show you how I'm going to climb out of there. So he went and he started cutting down trees. Yeah. At the age of 60, a general, a professor in the university, an engineer, cutting down their trees. Jeez. And then he got himself a diploma of a VCR technician. And then he got his diploma reinstated. But then he said, you know what, screw this, I'm going to go into politics. So he became the vice mayor at the end of the day with a nice cozy office. So within two years, without language and without anything from the forest, with convicts, we could, you know, go downhill and be like, my life is so bad. Like I had, right. I had such a great job and I had a, an apartment and now I have nothing. Yeah. So he said, nobody owes me nothing. Right. If I want to change my situation, I can. It, it's only up to me. I need to like roll my sleeves up, tighten my belt and go do what needs to be done. And that's the lesson that I learned nice. for life from, from, this, this guy that I'm going to go visit tomorrow, you know, grandpa with my kids, his grand grandkids, you know? That's awesome. Um, so, those are the people that like shape your life. So, there's always yeah. two different attitudes when you look at a situation, uh, and the situation is overwhelming. And we, we all, me and you and everybody, we end up in a situation that's overwhelming. Yeah. So, you can either go get drunk and hang yourself. Mm. or burst in tears or you can man up maybe still get drunk but then <laughs> go and deal with the situation they go, go deal, with, deal it, with it man. yeah go deal with it you know because every situation is possible to be fixed to get out of um everything as a solution that's so good he you know he man I, he general like the amount, the chips you can get on your shoulder, right? Like general is up there. That's not like a captain or a colonel. You have all these people that do exactly what you say. That do yet. You're a professor. You all these students. You you are in control. You're in power. Power, and then you have it all stripped away. Man, I, I would I would probably I'd find it hard for me to not be bitter in that situation. Or, or but yeah, but. But he just climbed out of there. He's like, I'll cut, I'll cut, cut some trees down, and then started working and shifting and changing and doing things. But he didn't just stay in the in the woods. It sounds like he was doing things after the fact. You know, you know, getting that of course, of getting course, diplomas, working the politics. Yeah. That's really cool. Of course, absolutely, because uh, you know he immediately jumped up because he's like he's into like into command and power. So then, right. okay, I'm into that. That got stripped off. Okay, I'm just gonna go and get it again. Right. What is the life? What is the plan? How do, how do I get that? How do I get that? So he built himself a plan. He's like, I don't have the language. Okay, so the first step is I need to teach myself the language. Right. I need the people. Okay, I need the people's support. How do I get people's support? What's, what's the population? 
who's going to be my target? Okay, so let's say there's three different groups of people. There's right. the working class, there's the rich people, there's the, the, the bitter immigrants. Whom am I going to target? I'm not even going to target the bitter immigrants. I'm also going to go target the working class. Those are the people that are going to vote for me. What do I need to do for them to vote for me? Mm -hmm. And like it's a step-by-step -step plan. He built up the plan. He executed it. And obviously, it, it, it works because any plan built properly without any interference from like forces of nature is going to work out. Right. You know? Yeah, because you also you plan for the when it doesn't work out. You have a plan and you adjust, you adapt, you go from there. Is he going to challenge you to push-ups tomorrow when you meet him? Meet up with him? So he got he got himself arthritis from the three years ago. Uh, fall like, push-ups. Uh, you know, arthritis, arthritis. Yeah. So he said that's how the knuckle push-up started. It was normal push-ups, but then he got arthritis. So he said this is a challenge. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna right. go do push-ups on my knuckles with arthritis. Dude, you don't even read about stuff like that. And then no. you told me about U.S. Marines. Come on. Oh, uh, please, dude. I grew up doing knuckle push-ups. I, I don't even yeah. – it doesn't even feel right doing it flat on my hands. Like, what is that? Right. On one hand. Like, on one hand. Yeah. One hand – one finger uh, – a couple fingers, right? A couple finger push-ups. Right. And then I'm clapping right. with one hand as I, as I jump up from that. <laughs> right. No, no. They're into sports. We're very into sports. Yeah. Uh, I have to go do some push-ups after this, man. Make sure I, I stay yeah. on top of my game. I, I literally was running in. I just came with my uh, three kids. I go swimming with them. Oh, yeah. Uh, so it's weights in the morning, weightlifting in the morning, uh, and swimming in the evening. That's awesome. You got, you got to stay active. And doing it with the kids, too, is important. I actually, speaking of push-ups, I taught my son how to do push-ups. I think it was yesterday or two days ago. We were just doing a little workout, waiting for the ladies to get home, and and uh, you know he's he's five, so he's, he's we're like no, 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 push yourself up like this, and okay, now keep that back straight here, keep your body. So it was kind of funny just teaching these things and and you know doing sit ups together. I'm like, okay, sit on my feet, and I'm gonna do, it, and then I'm gonna sit on your feet, and it was just cool, you know, it's cool to involve you know the kids in the workout, so they Absolutely. see what it's like to to stay fit and healthy and active. Absolutely. Well, this has been cool. I don't know if you've seen the clock, but time is just like zapped by. Yes, it pretty is. Pretty quick, man. It's pretty, well, pretty this quick. has been awesome. You know, thank you so much for coming on here. This is great. Thank you for having me. I've got like pages and pages of notes over here been taken. Whoa. It's been awesome. Fantastic. So uh, thanks again. And for everyone listening, Absolutely. we're going to, we're going to have uh, show notes, you know, all, all the different things we talked about. We're going to put some descriptions in there for you and links. Uh, actually, no, what's another thing? How can people connect with you? Is LinkedIn the way to go? Where should people go uh, to connect and maybe just, you know, find out more? If you, if you Google my name, yeah. I'm the first result. Tal Paterin, I'm the first name. Got if it. you type in ksw.solutions, that's the website. Got it. Um, Facebook, LinkedIn, website, uh, the website of all the contacts, the WhatsApp, the phone numbers, emails, you name it. I'm very easily accessible by any means of communication. Definitely. And we'll put a link to the book as well because um, that'll be important. And then also, um, yeah, people can start getting some of the videos that you've been doing. Just you know, connect with you on LinkedIn. It's a great idea. Absolutely. Cool. Well, Absolutely. thanks again, man. It's been awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And this has been the Hardcore Marketing Show. We'll catch you all next time.